Okay, we're talking about um, spatial autocorrelation here in part two. Um, first of all, who of you has heard of Tobler's first law of geography? And this sounds like a really archaic thing. Uh, this is the, the concept that near things are more related than distant things. But first of all, that isn't Tobler. This is Tobler. His name's Waldo Tobler. And his first law of geography states that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. And you can see in this figure that we're talking about more than simply spatial locations. It's the attributes or values associated with the location that are relevant to the relationship. Okay, um, I would be pretty irresponsible if I got through this conversation without at least mentioning the modifiable aerial unit problem. Um, this is one of the better known problems in geography and spatial analysis. Uh, the concept basically illustrates the need for considering area and space in our analyses and the uncertainties that underlay the analyses that we perform about the real world with spatial data that's fundamentally, you know, uh, manufactured or in some way generalized. Um, there's an inherent disconnect between reality and the way that reality is conceptualized with digital data. So basically, this concept refers to the problem of imposing arbitrary boundaries on normally continuous geographic phenomena. So the results of our analyses are going to be sensitive to the size or shape of the zones that we impose to organize or aggregate the data. So in this example here, imagine that the red dots are underperforming schools and the black dots are meeting or exceeding standards. This top figure is organized in such a way that summary statistics for each district would reveal even distributions of overall performance because they're, they're, all, they're all the same. So it's going to show that the districts are all slightly above standards, even though there are schools that are performing exceptionally well and some that are very substandard. So what if we redrew the lines to define the districts like this? Now we have a delineation that clearly reveals these extreme clusters of overperforming schools and underperforming schools. And then this issue of shape size um, is going to complicate or obfuscate our out outcomes even more. Um, just because like what if we even subdivided this further um, or if we treated these data points as continuous surfaces the cell size is going to dictate how the points are aggreg aggregated so even if we treat them as individual points um, you know you can't really do that with density of points if it's each uh, point for example is a person with spatial data we're always going to have to conceptualize this data and if we converted it even to raster format the cell size like I was saying, is going to dictate how these are aggregated. So it really is kind of a, an interesting problem. Think about gerrymandering. Gerrymandering involves reshaping voting, voting districts based on political affiliations of citizens um, to deliberately create numeric advantages for one political party or another, right? So you can see here in the top figure an example of fair districts, where there's an equal number of registered voters for each party. If the Republicans wanted to have an advantage, just for an example, they might wish to redraw the district boundaries so that more districts have a majority of registered Republicans. And that way they're going to just, you know, outnumber. Well, when we impose an organizational boundary on data that isn't really physically or otherwise constrained by that boundary, then we are by definition altering the system. And this can result in, uh, in artificial results and artificial identification of spatial patterns, and also misidentification of spatial phenomenon. And it's, it's troubling. It's a deceptively obvious problem. The conclusions that we draw are going to vary depending on how we choose to spatially organize and classify our data. So in other words, <laughs> again, the way that we choose to interpret a landscape depends on where we draw the borders. And that is what we think of as this modifiable aerial unit problem. Um, it's it's kind of like the uncertainty conversation that we had. We can't avoid this with spatial data. You know, we can't represent the real world as the real world, or we would have maps and data sets that are as big as the real world. So some sort of generalization always has to be taking place, and the way we choose to generalize is always going to affect the outcomes. And if we just turn a blind eye to that, um, I just don't think we're doing very intelligent work. Okay, so what is spatial autocorrelation? From Esri's GIS dictionary, it is a measure of the degree to which a set of spatial features and their associated data values 
tend to be clustered together in space, which is a positive spatial autocorrelation, or dispersed in space, which is a negative spatial autocorrelation. Um, it is basically the correlation of a, ver of a variable with itself through space. And one of the main reasons that spatial autocorrelation is important is because statistics relies on the assumption that observations are independent from one another. And if autocorrelation exists in a map, then this just fundamentally violates the fact that observations are independent from one another. So that's why we have to pay attention to it. So how are we going to measure it? We are going to use something called Moran's eye. And I'm going to just deviate entertaining uh, you for a second by explaining that Moran's eye is not the same thing as uh, a bullseye. It is not the same thing as bird's eye. Um, it is also not the same thing as Moran's eye, I mean as uh, the eye of Sauron. And if you wait for it, and for those of you who are old enough to remember it, oh yeah, the eye of the tiger. It is also not that kind of eye. Uh, this is Pat Moran. We're also not talking about his eye. He's the guy who invented this Moran's eye index. Uh, we're talking about this eye. And I know it's hard to concentrate on this eye with Survivor on the screen. Okay, so I'll cover them up. Uh, spatial autocorrelation, Moran's eye. This is the tool. Uh, basically, it's the most common measure of spatial, of spatial autocorrelation out there. Moran's eye tells us how related values are based on the locations where they were measured. So this is about the attributes or values associated with a, a spatial location. Uh, it tells us whether the pattern of feature values is clustered, dispersed, or random. Just like the point pattern analysis, it's the exact same thing, except um, we're talking about the values associated with place. So just like point pattern analysis, the output of Moran's eye can be uh, classified as positive, negative, or no spatial autocorrelation. Um, spatial correlations that are positive are where similar values cluster together in a map. And negative spatial autocorrelation is when dissimilar values are proximate to each other in a map. And so really quickly, I also want to draw your attention to the conceptualization of spatial relationships uh, parameter. Uh, in the tool. Just as a quick explanation, um, you definitely can look this up in the ArcGIS resources. When you click on this and have the uh, show help open, there's a really nice description of all of the different conceptualization models. Um, but just briefly, the inverse distance means that all features influence all other features. But the closer something is, the heavier the influence it has. Um, distance band means that features outside of a specified distance will have no influence at all on the features within that area. And then, um, and then there are a lot of other options in here. So take a look at these, because these greatly impact the results that you're going to get. And that's important to not blow off those kind of default things. OK, so the Moran's Eye tool produces three outputs. The Moran's Eye index value, a z-score, and a p-value, which again uh, evaluates the significance of the index. A positive index value, values that approach positive 1, indicate clustering. Um, values close to negative 1 indicate negative correlations or dispersion. And uh, when the index is close to 0, that's the random distribution. So I, um, hopefully that makes sense. These, these are what the um, Moran's I index values would be for these random different um, data sets. Now, when a p-value is small and the z-score is enough to fall outside the confidence level, that means the null hypothesis can be rejected. Or in other words, that means the data is showing a pattern that's just too unusual to be a pattern of uh, random chance. And there is spatial clustering of values associated with the geographic features in the study area. So along with this index, we always have to be considering the, the, like the um, p-values and the z-scores. Here's another. Uh, Another couple of examples. So in this top map, the polygon values might represent something like mean household age. The Moran's index is negative 0.12, which means the values are slightly dispersed. And this might tell us that there really isn't a strong spatial pattern to explain the distribution of mean household ages. Does that make sense? Uh, in the bottom map, the Moran's I is 0.26, which means the values are exhibiting slight clustering, slightly more clustering than this one was showing dispersion. Near features are more related than distant features in this uh, map. 
Now it's important to know that the index doesn't just differentiate between, or that it doesn't differentiate between high feature values and low feature values. It only indicates whether or not near features are similar, but it doesn't um, deal with high or low values. But um, on the other hand, there's a tool called hotspot analysis. And the one we run in this lab is this um, GI star version of the hotspot analysis. This tells us where clusters of high value and clusters of low values exist. This, so this is kind of the contrary to the last tool. Um, hot spots are going to be clusters of high values, and cold spots are going to be clusters of low values. So to be statistically significant, a hot spot has to have high value and be surrounded by other entities with high values. Uh, cold spots will have a low value and be surrounded by other features with low values. The output from the hotspot analysis tool is a z-score and a p-value for each feature. That's also what's different about this one. Um, these values represent the statistical significance of the spatial clustering of values. But again, these values are going to be highly influenced by the boundaries that organize the data, or in our case, the way you choose to conceptualize the spatial relationships. Remember the inverse distance, fixed distance band, zone of indifference that we just talked about. Um, and also the scale of the analysis or in our case with points, the distance band that you uh, utilize. So a high z-score and a small p-value, the probability for a feature, is going to indicate a spatial clustering of high values. A low negative z-score and small p-value indicates spatial clustering of low values. The higher or lower the z-score, the more intense the clustering. So a z-score near zero is going to ind indicate basically no apparent spatial clustering and randomness. I know I kind of keep going over the same things. Um, I, sometimes I feel like if I just repeat myself, sometimes it'll click and make sense. <laughs> I, at least that's how I personally work. Okay, so here's what the tool looks like. It's going to help us um, identify things like where are we seeing unexpectedly high crime rates, for example, or where are we seeing unexpectedly low high school graduation rates. Those would be cold spots. The hotspot analysis tool works by looking at each feature relative to its neighboring features. If the value for a feature is high, that could be interesting by itself, but if the value for a feature is high and the values for its neighboring features are also high, that turns it into a hotspot. So say you want to determine where, where there are high incidents of animal road kills um, to identify potential locations for wildlife crossings. You're going to build some. You can run the hotspot analysis on the raw incident counts, and this is going to be useful for things like resource allocation issues. But um, think about the example of home foreclosures. I found this online. You would probably expect more home foreclosures in locations with more homes, right? But if you divide the number of foreclosures by the number of homes that there are, you are essentially normalizing the data and then run the hotspot analysis on that ratio or that normalized data, and then you're going to get an answer that tells you where there are unexpectedly high numbers of foreclosures given the number of homes, instead of simply knowing where there just are a lot of foreclosures. So this is really relevant to our Bigfoot analysis. We might want to control for expected relationships, like would we expect to have more sightings in places where, where there are more people? Well, maybe or maybe not. Would we expect to have more sightings where people are more likely to be, like roads or, you know, high population densities? Maybe or maybe not. Um, we're not going to get into doing that, but if you want to experiment with uh, normalizing population data um, against some other measure, like population density um, or roads or something like that, um, absolutely feel free to. So that's pretty much it. Um, Use the resources that Esri has amassed to fill in the gaps um, of what I've um, presented here today. There are a lot of geospatial statistical tools out there. If you look in the spatial statistics toolbox that ARC has, for example, you'll see a whole bunch of different tools, and they all vary a little bit. Each one is going to be um, more or less relevant depending on what kind of questions you're trying to answer. Um, sometimes I personally find it easiest just to start running tools. You definitely need to research your input parameters, take a really hard look at your data, and evaluate your results carefully, and then just run it again. Or try, um, you know, try a similar tool that has a slightly different focus. There is no right way to use a tool, so it's impossible for me to just say, here's how you need to do this, because it just doesn't work that way, obviously. Um, 
the use needs to fit your purpose, like what, quest what questions are you trying to answer, and also what kind of data you're using, and the scale that you're trying to analyze. So you definitely need to experiment. Um, see just if you can actually have some fun doing statistics. I think when we bring statistics into the, the spatial realm, they actually get kind of interesting for the first time, at least in my personal experience. Um, yeah, so see what you can discover about the spatial distribution of Bigfoot sightings, and then report back. If you have questions, let me know, and um, I will just talk to you all soon.